Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Come on, lift your voice and say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
is the joy in the strength of my life. God is the joy in the strength of my life. God is the joy in the strength of my life. God is the joy in the strength of my life. God is the joy in the strength of my life. God is the joy in the strength of my life. God is the joy in the strength of my life. God is the joy in the strength of my life. He moves all pain. He moves all pain. Misery and strife. He to keep. He promised to keep. Never me. to leave. Me. Never to leave. Never me. ever. Never ever, ever come short of His word. I've got to fast and pray. Fast and pray. Stay, in, Stay the in the narrow way. Keep my life clean. Keep my life clean. Each and every day. Every day. I wanna go with Him. I want to go with Him. I wanna go with Him. I wanna go with him. a great big hand clap of praise everywhere come on let's clap our hands and give God praise on tonight hallelujah hallelujah father we thank you we give you glory we give you honor we certainly give you reverence and praise and we don't take it lightly that you have given us another opportunity to come into your house to come into your presence God we worship you you've been good to us all day long Thank you. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for keeping us clothed and in our right minds. Thank you. Somebody tell them thank you. Thank you that death didn't snatch us up out of here last night. Thank you that terminal illness did not set in our bodies. 
thank you that sickness didn't have its way thank you that the devil kept oh god his hands off of us thank you that you kept terrorist attacks away from our door god we got a reason to tell you thank you thank you for being so good for what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him for you've made us lower than angels but yet and still you're concerned about us and even tonight father as we have come oh god to sit and to deal with some very real issues i ask tonight lord that you will give us insight that you will give us wisdom beyond our years that you would give somebody the answers that they need god heal somebody tonight minister to the wounded tonight deliver the brokenhearted tonight somebody just lift your hand and tell them have your way let there be a release of the anointing that leaves us forever changed and will praise you forever in Jesus name and all of the people of God said amen come on put those hands together and give God great praise wherever you are tonight before you take your seats I just want you to throw your arms around somebody and tell them I'm so glad to see you in the house of the Lord amen just throw your arms around somebody and tell them I'm so glad thank you I'm so glad to see you in the house of the Lord amen I'm so glad you're here I know many of you you've been at work all day long amen some of you have been handling things but you made it to church tonight and uh, I want you to know that your coming is not in vain amen how many of you believe the Lord has something for you tonight Amen. I believe he does. And I'm very excited about our Grace Empowerment uh, Network, uh, which is a ministry of our church that is striving uh, to tackle some of the real life issues and challenges uh, that people deal with in their uh, everyday lives and we know that one of the great challenges that I think all of us have dealt with at some point or another it is the issue of grief and uh, that grief it, it it shows up in different ways sometimes it's the grief of the loss of a loved one uh, sometimes it's the grief of a grief of a loss of opportunity sometimes it's the grief of the loss of relationship uh, grief arises in a number uh, of different circumstances, uh, but we're going to deal with it tonight. I'm very excited about our panel who is going to be introduced to you uh, in just a moment, and I'm excited about sharing and dialoguing with them. Uh, but I'm going to call forth our uh, moderator who is going to come at this time, and she's going to lead our conversation. She is none other uh, than Missionary Miracle Malone. Is she still in the room? Oh, there she is. Let's clap our hands for Missionary Malone as she comes at this time. And she's going to lead us in our dialogue tonight. Come on, let's give it up for her. Amen. Put your hands together for the Grace Empowerment Network. Amen. We thank God for again this ministry that is focused on providing both spiritual and practical enrichment for the members of grace cathedral and i first wanted to acknowledge the leaders of that team elder christopher brassard would you stand and wave your hand he's the director of gen and we dare not not acknowledge sister missionary angela harris who's also leading up this entity and so tonight Tonight is going to be a great session. Tonight, we're just gonna consider this to be group therapy. Is that all right? We're just gonna consider this to be group therapy. So I want everybody to do me a favor. Everybody breathe in, breathe out. That felt good, let's do it again. Breathe in, breathe out. All right, so we're gonna play a short video and then after that video, I'm going to introduce our panelists for this evening.
we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to bring up our, our panelists for this evening. And so I'm going to read a little bit about them, um, just so you guys know who it is that is among you. I know that, uh, raise your hand if this is your first time attending a gin event. No, Grace is new. A lot of hands, a lot of hands. So for everyone that may be new to Grace or may be new to Jen, I want to introduce a few of the panelists that we'll be sharing on tonight. I want you guys to put your hands together for Evangelist Candace Johnson Mills. Evangelist Candace Johnson Mills. As she makes her way to the stage, I'm going to read a little bit about each person. I know you guys see her in, in praise and worship in the pulpit and worship on Sunday, but Candace is also a licensed evangelist in the Church of God in Christ and a faithful member of Grace Cathedral, where she serves as the leader, the division leader of our worship and arts division. Um, she's the founder of My Sister's Keeper, which is an outreach ministry, which was founded in 2013. Um, she has a Bachelor of Science in Business Management and a Master of Science in Clinical Research Management. She's a senior clinical research professional in her industry. She's also a professional singer, playwright, and actress. And among all of her many gifts, she considers her greatest gift is being a loving and devoted mother to her two daughters, Sierra and Kayla Mills. Put your hands together for evangelist, world-renowned international evangelist, Candace Johnson Mills. All right, the next person who will be on our panel this evening, um, you guys know her. If you've ever seen anybody passing out snacks in the bag, the freshest grapes, they got to come directly from heaven. The freshest grapes I've ever had in my entire life. And they're consistent and it's, it's fresh every week. Uh, put your hands together for Sister Alvia Potter, a.k.a. Mama Doty, is going to be sharing with us on this evening. Come on, Doty. Doty serves as our usher board president. She also is the director of our newly formed Grace Welcome Team. Um, she's a retired healthcare administrator assistant a mental health geriatrics, and above all, she is a loving mother. She wants, she put that in all caps. She is a loving mother and a strong woman of God. Put your hands together for Sister Doty on tonight. Next, I wanna to introduce to the stage Elder Charles Holland. Elder Charles Holland, come and join us here. Elder Charles Holland is a former military combat medic. So he's a veteran. Uh, we. Uh, a former CPS investigator of child deaths and physical abuse, former life coach for youth dealing with trauma, a CPI trainer for trauma-informed teaching, and he is currently a high school administrator in Dallas ISD. Put your hands together for Elder Charles, Elder Charles Holland. Sister Tiffany Divins, Sister Tiffany Divins, will you join us tonight? Put your hands together for Sister Tiffany. Sister Tiffany is a senior compensation HRIS analyst and a youth department volunteer. She's a California transplant, so she ain't from around here. And she's been in the Dallas area for about five years. She has a wonderful and caring foundation in her cousin and in her family and her, her aunt. And she is a firm believer that God doesn't make mistakes and that it's all working for her good. Put your hands together for Sister Tiffany. And we thank God for one of our subject matter experts who, who just entered. I give her a chance to, to kind of catch her breath. Traffic was crazy. Did anybody come down 20? Now, I normally don't tell my business, but I live about seven minutes from the church, and it took me 40 minutes to get here. That's how bad traffic was today. So we pray for everyone who's in their route to service on this evening, that God cover and protect them from any hurt, harm, or danger. But uh, we, I will go ahead and introduce, read her bio a little bit. Sister Helen Ratliff, will you put your, guy, put your hands together for Sister Helen. Sister Helen will be serving as one of our um, subject matter experts on tonight. She is a, a registered nurse and a certified hospice and palliative care nurse. Um, she has been a nurse for over 32 years and 24 of those years has been serving as a hospice nurse. So put your hands together for Sister Helen. We give God praise for Dr. Linda Gant, she was unable to be here on tonight. She had, uh, one of her grandchildren had an accident that, um, it was a pretty serious accident. So she's home taking care of her family. We keep her, her grandchild in prayer. But she would have been joining us on tonight as the licensed counselor uh, for tonight. Uh, but we give God praise for her. And last but certainly not least, I don't think I have to give him much of an introduction. Can you put your hands together for Pastor Nathaniel Green will be joining us on the panel tonight.
and last, again, I'm sorry, last but certainly not least, um, can you put your hands together for Sister Tamika Cook will be joining us on tonight. We have a lot of healthcare professionals that are among us here at Grace. Tamika is a seasoned practice administrator for Texas Oncology, which is one of the, the, one of the largest oncology centers here in the state of Texas. She is a single mother of a, of a teenage boy. Is Zach here tonight? Is Zach in the building? He's not, you left. <laughs> we love Zach tonight. And she serves as a part of our women's department. So put your hands together again for Sister Tamika Cook. And so on tonight, as Pastor stated, Jen will be uh, hosting a session for us to talk about grief, talk about loss. How do we navigate loss when our rope breaks? And grief is a very natural response to loss. And so it's the emotional suffering for when you feel something or when someone you love is taken away. And I think that's something that everyone here in this room can, can attest to they have experienced. And so on tonight, this is not just about our panelists, this is almost also about, about you guys. So if you guys have the Grace app, we tell you every week, download the Grace app, download the Grace app. If you go to the Grace app, we want you to be able to participate with the panel. So if you go to the app and you go to the event on the app, if you look into the details, there's a website called menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I. Com. If you go into menti.com, you're going to enter in, you're going to enter in a code. You're going to enter in that code. That code is 31723378. So that's menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, real short, dot com. And the code to access the Q&A and to engage with us is 31723378. Three, seven, eight. And so once you get logged in, once you get logged in, you're going to be able to engage with us. And so how many people have it pulled up? You have it pulled up? I see a few hands. I'll give you guys a few more minutes. Y'all must got Androids. That's what it is. It's Androids in the building. It's menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I dot com. If you got an Apple phone, you should have been there by now. Amen. The code again is 31723378. And if you can't remember that, it is in the app on the details of the event. And so the first question, and if you can't get to the app, if you're not technology savvy like that, you can just holler out. I want you guys to enter in, what type of loss have you experienced? What kind of loss have you experienced? Again, loss is not limited to just death, right? Loss can be uh, uh, of various things. And I see we have some people here who are, who are chiming in here. Let's see what you guys, the code, three, one, seven, two, hi, yeah, 37, eight. All right, the, the, they're coming in. Loss of a daughter, my God. Relationship loss, friendship loss. I see parent is real big in my word cloud, so that means we have a lot of people here that may have lost their parents. We see my, my granny passed and my papa left. Praying for you, divorce, um, job. Job is another one. Peace, my God, peace. We have sister, we have death of a friend, grandparents, a brother and a father, aunt, so a lot of people that have experienced loss of their loved ones, two marriages, two marriages, loss of self, loss of self, a fiance, uh, so that's a, a failed engagement, nephew, so we have quite a bit of people who have experienced some form of loss on this evening. And so how we're gonna do this tonight, we're gonna have some of our panelists, they're gonna share their story. And I want you guys to, to encourage them and pray for them as they share, because I'll be honest with you guys, we did our run through the other night and we had to come and grab the Kleenex and pass the Kleenex because that's just how emotional the, the session got because everyone has experienced something whether it was something that you're dealing with right now, something that you were dealing with from your past, something you could have been dealing with as a child. 
And so we're going to start with evangelist Candace Johnson Mills. Will you share with us your story with loss? So I was married for eight years. Um, a lot of people don't know this because I don't really talk about my marital status. However, I was married for eight years. Both of my daughters came from that union. I was married to a minister, did a lot of ministry um, as a wife, and watered myself down to push and support uh, my ex-husband. However, after eight years of marriage, I was divorced. <clears throat> and uh, while being divorced, that's when I started going through a roller coaster of emotions. I had uh, said to the panel the other night that there were things that by the time you're at a certain place in relationships where you're just done, it doesn't bother you, it, you're, you're not phased anymore. But by the time I got the divorce, everything started coming up, everything started surfacing. So things that didn't bother me began to bother me. And so I found myself angry I found myself, I went through a stage of humiliation when I was going through the separation. I found myself, I was sitting in a service one day and God brought it to my attention. He said, remove your hand because I didn't realize that I would always cover up my left hand when I was separated because I had removed my ring. I was done. And so the thing was God had to bring it to my attention about what I was doing to hide what was going on and um, never dawned on me that I was doing that. So God started dealing with, dealing with me with that during the separation. But with the divorce again, like I said, the, everything just started surfacing. I had relocated here to Dallas, Texas, which was always a part of my plan uh, to move here. Um, relocated here uh, about two months after my divorce was finalized. I already had things, I'm a planner, so I had everything in motion with or without him, whether he was coming or not. And so when I got here, my focus was making sure that my daughters were okay. They were three, they were four and uh, seven, four and seven when I had gotten my divorce. And so my focus was making sure that they were okay. But when I started realizing the different emotions that I was going through, I went through humiliation, embarrassment, anger. I went through hatred. I had a lot of hatred in my heart towards that person. And then I went through, I went through hurt started dealing with the devastation of things and questioning God with God. But I remember I prayed to you about X, Y, Z, and you said, okay. And then I remember praying to you about this, and you told me, don't leave. You know what I mean? So I started going through all of that where I began questioning God, and I was devastated, and I was hurt, not because I wanted the marriage, but because it was a failed marriage. And I, um, I had to get to the place where I said, you know what? I will not turn to things or people to soothe what's going on. And so I begin to really see God, and it's not to be deep, but you have to tie God in at some point. I'm all for therapy. I'll tell anybody, go lay on somebody's couch and get it out. Get on the highway, roll down the windows and scream. So I'll never tell you don't go to therapy. Um, but I remember God started dealing with me about just different things because I was serious. I said, I refuse to go around being a bitter woman. I refuse to go around and being this, this, you know, they already give black women a stigma anyway, that we're angry, we're bitter, we're so aggressive. And I said, I refuse to be that person. Now my story is not every woman's story when it comes to being a single parent, because I was a for real single parent, uh, taking care of everything, everything was on me. And I was okay with that because I didn't have the story where I struggled financially. So that was not the issue. The issue was the, the past that I had to deal with along with the lack that my daughters had to deal with with not having a father, not only financially there, but even present, physically present, emotionally present. So God began to take me through this journey where I began to detox. And it was, a, it was a journey that was so fulfilling for me because it was not only a natural detox, it was a spiritual detox. It was to the point where God was having me write letters for things that I had, part, had, had allowed myself to indulge in where I was sending letters of apologies and letting people know I don't need a response. This is not for you to respond, this is for me. And I, was, I even wrote a letter to myself 
apologizing to myself for the things that I allowed, how I allowed it to pull me down, to drag me down. I won't go into detail, but you can only imagine when a person is going through a situation like that, especially when you're going through a divorce where you've given your all and you know you've done everything you can to be this, this good wife because I knew what it, was, what it was to be a wife. My parents were the perfect example. And so to see that fail, you know, you had, I had all of these thoughts running through my head. I, at one time, I felt like a failure. But then I began to realize everyone has free will. Everyone has, regardless of what God says, you still have free will. And you can make your own decision and your own choices of what it is that you will do. Um, but in the end, I thank God because I allowed God to heal me. I allow God to heal me. I never taught my daughters to hate their father, even though he was not there. I, I never taught them that he was nothing, even though he was not there. I always did everything that I could, even when I would hear them say certain things where I would try to defend you know, him to a certain degree. Because my, at the end of the day, I know what it's like to have a father and my father to be my hero. And I wanted that same thing for my daughters. But I allowed myself to go through the process of healing. And I also had to allow myself to walk in forgiveness, which is not an overnight thing. Healing is not an overnight thing. F walking in forgiveness takes days, years, I promise you. And so even now, it's still a process for me because you can easily be triggered, you can easily be triggered by certain things. But it was something that I allowed God to do in me and work out of me where there were things that he had to uproot out of me, pride. Pride. I had a lot of pride and I didn't even know it until I had to go through that place. And so for that, I am thankful. I'm here to let anyone know you can get through it and you don't have to allow yourself to be crippled because of uh, failed relationships or a relationship that you may have put your all in. Some people may not like the word failed, but a relationship that necess didn't necessarily go the way that you had expected. You can get through it and you can succeed. You can be successful while going through. Amen. 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 Thank you for, for sharing your story with us. You said something to me that I think is very important, which is you shared how you coped, the several different mechanisms that you went through to cope. Elder Holland, can you talk about how important is it to cope the right way? So I think it's very important that when we are coping with grief of any kind, that we seek out healthy options. Um, she mentioned a few things in there as she was talking. Uh, she mentioned about how she sought out therapy. Um, in our community, specifically the African-American community, we struggle with sitting down and talking to someone when we go through problems. And a lot of that is rooted in shame. Um, I like to use for a definition of shame. Shame is identifying with the mistake. It's letting that mistake be the thing that we identify with. And I think that when we are coping, we have to realize that whatever took place, um, that's not who we are. Um, the situation doesn't define you. And so I think that's one of the first major steps to coping with that issue. But I think also another step to coping, um, I always refer to a specific passage of scriptures in 2 Kings, uh, where they were all sitting around eating and they realized that they were eating a wild plant and the plant was actually killing them. And uh, uh, so you might have heard the phrase death in the pot. And what they realized when they were eating that was, oh, we're going to die from what we're eating. And the first thing that they did, they began to cry out, hey, we're going to die from this. And they sought out the right people. Um, and when the right person came in, which was the prophet, he was able to tell them what was needed to fix their situation. And I think that you can't tell your problems to everyone. Right. Um, however, I do feel like it's important that you do talk to people, and it's not just the, the therapist that you need to talk to. You need a support system. Um, that, is, that is one of the greatest things in coping. Now, one of the struggles there is finding the right support system. Um, but that's also the same process with, with shoe shopping. If you go to get a pair of shoes, they might look really nice in the store, but once you put them on, they might be really uncomfortable. And so you have to go and try a different pair of shoes or continue to try sizes until you find a shoe that fits and is comfortable for you. And it's the same thing with therapists. It's the same thing with people that you trust information with. Everything you can't talk to mama and daddy about. Everything you can't talk to your cousins and un un pookie about. Like some stuff you have to find different people to deal with your issues with. 
because it's cultural in a lot of instances. Sometimes um, the culture that you are a part of shape the responses that you receive. And you have to be careful uh, not to allow cultural things to cause you to become stagnant and find yourself in generational things. Uh, so those are two things that I would just suggest is check your circle um, as it relates to dealing with your issue as far as coping go, as well as uh, getting that help. Absolutely. And there was, there was something else. So speaking of culture, we are, you know, everybody in here. We are multi, we're multi, we're a diverse church, but we know we are a predominantly black church. And so we know what black culture looks like, especially here in the church. And Candace, you said something else that kind of stuck out to me. You said that you would mask your hand. You would mask your hand so that people would not know. Pastor Green, can you speak more about wearing ministry masks when you're grieving? That's a wonderful uh, topic to discuss. Um, I think sometimes, especially when you're in ministry, and I can relate to this, having gone through different types of grief over the year, over the years being in ministry. Um, but someone asked me a while ago, when do you feel most alive? And my response was, well, uh, outside of being with my wife and kids, I feel most alive when I'm preaching. That's, that's what I love doing. Um, that's when I just, you know, I feel my best, that's, that's my passion. Um, but sometimes when we do go through circumstances that cause us to grieve, we'll use ministry as a mask. And I've had moments where I was busying myself with ministering to people, but I wasn't busying myself enough with healing me. And it's so dangerous in a number of different ways because that moment on the stage is just a moment. Yes. That moment when you're before the crowd and, you know, because we are human beings, sometimes the response of the crowd, it brings a sense of encouragement to you as a deliverer, whether you're preaching or whether you're leading an initiative. Um, but when you're done doing that, you got to go home and sit with you. And sometimes I've found myself not wanting to go home to sit with me. The danger of that is sometimes you find yourself bleeding on the very thing that you're ministering to. Because when I'm done being alive, when I'm preaching, when I would have to deal with real issues administratively in my church, my attitude or my frustration or my anger from what I was not addressing personally would spill over into ministry in other ways. And that's why it is so important. The Bible said that uh, at one point in Elijah's ministry, he had become somewhat suicidal. And it begged one the question, how can this man be suicidal because he's going through what he's going through with Jezebel? But you're calling fire down from heaven. Yeah, but those were just moments. You know what I'm saying? I'm great in the moments, but then I got to go home and sit with me. And so I, I go back to what you said earlier. Uh, it's, it's good to get you some clinical help sometimes, to have you a therapist. You know what I'm saying? You need a strong support system. You need a therapist, but you also need individuals around you that will help, to, help you to process maybe what you've been masking. You know what I'm saying? You need a healthy circle a healthy circle of individuals you can talk to, a healthy circle of individuals that you can expose uh, your cuts and your bruises and, and your pains and your sorrows to, and people that will help you in a healthy way to sort through those changes. And it might sound churchy, but I don't care. You seriously, seriously need to take some time with God. Sometimes the only time that we take with God is for the mask that we have to wear, for the performance. But when you're done praying for a word for them, did you pray to get a word for you? When you're done connecting with God so that you can minister to them, do you have another space where you can sit with God 
and he ministers to you. And the reason why sometimes people don't like to hear that and their response is, oh, that's just so churchy. Well, the challenge is sometimes it's hard to do that if you're always having to start from scratch. But when you have a spiritual repository that you can pull from, it's not so hard for you to get in the vein by yourself for you with God and create a space of consecration where he can minister to you so that you don't have to keep using ministry as your man's. Amen. I think it's extremely important, you know, as we discuss, I think everyone who shares so far has discussed the importance of self, the things that you need to do to take care of yourself. But sometimes it's not just you. Sometimes you may have a spouse that you that is uh, that is leaning on you. You may have your children who are still depending on you. So it's one thing for you to be grieving, but it's another thing when you have children that are grieving. And so, Sister Tiffany, I'm going to ask if you would share your story with us tonight. Last year, I was at work, and I got a phone call um, from my cousin. She was like, you talk to your mom? I was like, no, she should be going away to get Zoe. And, sorry, my voice is going out. And she said, well, you need to call, because I got a call from the chaplain from the hospital, and you need to call this number. I said, okay, so I called the number, and the man says, your mom and your dad were in a pretty bad accident. You need to get to the hospital right now. Now, mind you, we were leaving that night to travel to California because my nephew had just passed two weeks prior. And I get to the hospital, and the chaplain comes, and they won't tell me anything. But I know something's wrong, because they don't just call the chaplain for anything. And the doctor comes, and she said, do you want me to tell you to be raw, or you need somebody? And I was like, just tell me. And she said, your mom didn't make it. She died on the operating table. And I broke down. Because my mom was my best friend. If you saw me, you saw her. If you saw her, you saw me. <laughs> so. <clears throat> My, my mom passed, and it was just devastating for our family because it happened in such a horrific way to me. I didn't think that would be the way my mom would go, not my mom. You know, she had defied a stroke, two strokes. And not a month later, my aunt passed. And a month after that, my daughter's other grandmother passed. Her dad's mom passed. That was all of a sudden. And then the month that same that night before her her other grandmother passed, my grandma passed. So we are experiencing death after death and loss after loss. And I'm going through it. Not even paying attention to what my daughter is going through. But I'm trying to think keep things normal for her keep going to school, you know, make sure everything is just fine for her. For me, it was the day she looked at me and she said, I don't have a grandma at all. My grandmas are all gone. They won't see me graduate. And I said, how does that make you feel? She said, I think I'm okay. But I knew that right then that I needed help. So I sought therapy. I started reading books about trauma. But not just trauma, but also about boundaries. Amen. Amen. Because I had learned, here I am 30-something, and really had no idea about boundaries. And boundaries are important because it teaches other people how to treat you especially during a time of loss. So you figure out how to tell people, I don't need that right now. But I'm thankful that I'm still in my healing process. And I thought I had a good prayer life until I lost my mom. Because I realized she was the person I told everything to. And I remember Pastor 
doing a whole series about praying. And he re I remember something you said during one of your, one of your, uh, one day when you were preaching, you said, I could preach, I could pray for you all day. But you gotta learn how to pray for yourself. And that played over and over in my mind. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and just, yeah, and just asking God to just comfort me. Because that's all I wanted. I wanted comfort. And I want my mom. And I felt like this sense of just stillness just come over me. And I know I'm not healed, but I know, and I know it's a process and I know it takes time, but I feel good about that process. Yeah. Knowing that I have God and I have this foundation of my church and my family and staying connected and being sure that I'm not, I know that I'm not doing it by myself. And I appreciate that and I acknowledge that and I love that and I lean on that. We are praying for you. Are we praying for Sister Tiffany? Amen. Amen. We are definitely praying for you, and we're praying for, for your daughter. Elder Holland, can you talk a little bit about how children process grief? Uh, sure. So children, they grieve different than adults. Um, for adults, we face multiple griefs, but children face multiple griefs in a totally different way. Um, when children grieve, they grieve every time there's a significant event in their life as a child. Now, you think as an adult, we grieve for significant events too, but they grieve at school events. Uh, you have muffins for moms. If they've lost a mother, that's a constant reminder every single year that their mother's not there. You have donuts for dads, a constant reminder that they don't have a father. And children don't just grieve as it relates to death. If they have a parent who's incarcerated, uh, they grieve that incarceration every single time that holiday comes up. If they have a parent who just doesn't want anything to do with them, they grieve that around those different holidays and seasons that arise. And so with children, we have to be careful about how we label them um, concerning their behavior. Because when children grieve, a lot of times it shows up as anger. It shows up as resentment. Um, and there might even be a child in here now, they're angry, and then 10, 15 minutes later, they don't even realize why they were angry. Um, that, that's one of those things that come with a child grieving. And, and it's like I said, it's not just if a child grieves death. Um, it can show up in their behavior at school. Um, we have ADHD and ADD. Those are no longer terms that are used now. It all falls under one umbrella. But those were things that children would show up presenting with uh, when they were grieving. They would struggle to pay attention. They would disconnect in different environments. Also, you might be dealing with a child who not necessarily disconnects from the environment, but doesn't have the ability to hold relationships with people. Um, every time your child go to play with anybody, they fight. <laughs> you know, uh, grief can show up in a, multiple, in, in a multitude of different ways. And then we even take that a step further. Let's talk about children with disabilities. Because here at Grace, we do have young people that present with different special needs and disabilities that they have. When a child with disability grieves, specifically those that are dealing with autism or things like that that are on the lower end of the spectrum, um, those children, sometimes it shows up for them almost like it shows up for a geriatric patient who has Alzheimer's. They forget about it, and then it comes around again, and you have to keep going over the same information, so it forces them to grieve multiple times, and it also forces you to grieve that thing multiple times. I think it's important to know that when we're looking at how children grieve and how adults grieve, that there's always multiple griefs within the grief. There's gonna be grief for the past, there's always gonna be an element of what could have happened, what should have happened, um, but there's gonna be an element of grief for the present because that person is not there currently. But then there's also future grief. Um, and for those children specifically who has a parent who was incarcerated or a parent who rejected them, they're grieving the idea of what a parent should be. Um, so that child is faced with a whole nother level of what their grief looks like. How we can support children, number one, don't refer to children as bad. Um, and, and some people say, no, nah, that boy just bad. I don't care what you say, Elder Holland, he bad. No, call him an opportunity. 
Um, you have to reframe the way we think about children when they're faced with different obstacles. Some of them do need a whooping, but that whooping is an opportunity, not because they're bad. I'm going to give you an opportunity to feel what it looks like when you do wrong. So we have to frame it. <laughs> we have to frame it in a certain way because, because the words you speak over your children now will be the words that they live by later. So, so first, don't frame them as bad children. They, they are opportunity children. Another thing, uh, get your children into some kind of counseling if you see that they're dealing with those behaviors and attributes often. And then another thing that you can do as a parent, if, if a father's not there, if a mother's not there, if they're missing a grandparent, um, find trusted people that can step in and play the role. Um, there are people that hopefully are in this church that you can trust to play the role. Find people that can step in and be that grandparent where they have no grandparent. Um, one of the most crucial things in my life from loss was I didn't have a father, but I had a pastor, right? And my pastor stepped in and he played the father role. At graduation, he was there. At, at this event, he was there. At that event, he was there. Uh, find people um, and maybe even be the person for someone who is lacking in those areas. Um, so just think about those things as it relates to the children. Also, last but not least, um, teach your children how to cope using the word. Um, one of the things that I think made me a preacher, I'm kind of not happy with God about that because I didn't want to preach y'all. But anyway, um, I didn't. It was not a thing. But um, when I would find myself extremely upset, I would go sit in the bathroom until my legs were numb. Y'all know that feeling because y'all sit there and watch videos. But uh, I would sit there until my legs were numb and I would read the Bible, right? And that became my coping mechanism. I would look for things in the Bible to argue with my mama about. Because if she was going to tell me I had to clean my room, I was going to try to find a scripture where something was dirty and they didn't clean it. Right? So I started reading my Bible. Help your kids find healthy ways to cope. If it's reading the Bible, if it's going out to the gym, if it's playing a sport, get out there and do it with them. Yes. Amen. So for those who have dealt with those type of scenarios, those type of circumstances, Find healthy ways to cope. Make sure that you establish a strong prayer life. Make sure that you get the counseling and, and take advantage of the resources that are available to you. Make sure you build a strong support system because all of those things are gonna help you navigate those kind of losses. Um, so next we're gonna have a different kind of loss. And so Mama Doty, will you share your story with us on how you navigated your circumstance of loss? Well, first of all, I dealt with like a double blow. First, um, my grieving started way before my mom passed. My grieving started as being her caretaker. When I had to go, when I used to, used to bring my mom to church every Sunday, and she would respond to what was going on in church. I knew things were shifting, because she wasn't living with me then, but I was bringing her to church, but I knew things were shifting when we would ride home from church. I know matter how many times I would tell her what pastor's name was, he was still, this is funny y'all, he was still that little yellow man preached this morning. <laughs> and then we would ride home the next Sunday, Ooh, that white man preached. <laughs> and then the next Sunday, it always would be, ooh, Bishop Red. I mean, he was Bishop. Bishop preached. But you know what? I responded. They sure did, Mama. I never would say, Mama, you just said that a while ago. Whatever she said, and that was hurting me to the gut. And when I would go in, because my mom had got to be where she was total care, I moved my mom in with me. I gave up working. I gave up loving something I used to do, working in health care, working with mental illness, working with geriatric. I loved that. And I was one of the daughters. I gave up a lot. 
to take care of my mom. I moved to in with me, me and my husband was a team. The kids, we all had a, we had a shift. You know, we would do things some morning, I would go in my mom's room and get ready to get her ready for the day. She didn't know who I was. I had to step back out in the hallway to get myself together. Then I would tell my husband, you go in there because she's not knowing who I am. He would go in there, hey, baby. I knew you was coming. And I, was, I couldn't understand why my mama didn't know me, even though I worked with it. But this time, I was on the other side of the fence. It was my turn. But anyway, with my mom, she got, I went in her room one morning to get her ready for the day. I pulled back the cover on her bed. Her bed was covered with blood. I told my husband to call 911. They got her to the hospital. Nobody could find what was wrong with my mom. She left home that day, never came back. She was diagnosed with, I don't know the big name of it, but it was cancer in her bowel duct. And we was told once it's diagnosed like that, it's already, it's nothing they can do. She was already, her body couldn't take nothing else. I stayed at that hospital 37 days with my mom. My husband would cook and bring food. We would just tag team and back and forth. And uh, that was before we got to the hospital, one day I was at home and I prayed and I asked God, I said, can you just give me my mama for about five minutes? so she'll know who I am. Let me tell y'all something, God gave me that five minutes. I was bathing my mom and she said, Dodi, baby, I wish I could help you. I jumped. I said, mama, you know who I am. Sure, I know my baby. She said, I wish I could help you. I hate to see you doing all this by yourself. She said, sit down and just sit down with mama and this and that. I said, mama, I said, what's my name? She said, girl, if you ask me that one more time, Dodi, and I was like, oh, guys, I, I mean, and it was five minutes. And then after that, I went to ask her something else, and she called me her sister, Ernestine. And I said, okay. But after we got to the hospital, I knew she wasn't going back home. But to make a long story short, when my mama got put in the hospice unit, that floor felt like death. I was on that floor with my mom. I was afraid to stay in the room. I would sleep in the family room, but I wouldn't stay in that room. But the night she died, it's like God said, you're going to stay in that room. I stayed in that room with my mom that night. I told everybody else, y'all go home. Y'all got jobs to go to. Go home. And they teased me, mom, you're not going to stay in there. You're too scary. I said, no, I'm going to stay with mama tonight. God prepared me for my mama. When my mama died, I mean, the, the little aide left out the room. I said, go, baby, go give me some blankets or something. I could make this shirt out of a bed or something. That child wasn't going out that room five minutes, and I heard my mom grunt. She went, mm. And I think some of them hadn't even made it out of the parking lot. And I looked over. That's how the strength God gave me. Because I looked over at my mama. I said, so you was just waiting on me to stay in here with you tonight, huh? I got on, I went and told the staff. They was running all over the place. I got on the phone, I called the funeral home, I called pastor, and pastor always say, this was the calmest woman calling me to tell me that her mama died. But God prepared me. But that second blow, 10 months later, I wasn't prepared for that one. Me and my husband had joked and played the night before, we ate and all this stuff here. Normal things we do. Remember, I said God didn't prepare me for this one. 4-17, January 17, 4-17 in the morning, I heard a crash. When I got up, my husband was in between the bedroom and the bathroom. I jumped up and I said, what are you doing? And I thought he was having a seizure. He never had seizures. And he was just shaking and shaking. And I screamed for my oldest daughter because I couldn't touch, can't get hold to nothing. And I kept telling him to hold on to me. I said, hold on to me. And I do believe now when people used to say a death grip, he put a death grip on me. He was holding so hard, and the last thing he left me with, my husband had a, number one, he had a massive heart attack. Right in our bedroom. 
30 years of marriage was taken from me. No explanation, no nothing. I felt like God should have gave me the same thing he gave me with my mom. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. I didn't want to pray. I didn't want nobody telling me nothing. I didn't want nothing but my husband. I, uh, I had to call pastor again. But this time, I, had, I couldn't hardly tell him what was going on. I got confused and everything that was, I knew my husband was dead when the machine that they was using on him, the AED machine, and when the machine said, do not shop, I knew my husband was dead, but I was mad at God. I was mad. I was told, you can't get mad at God. I'm gonna eventually have to call that person and try to apologize, but you do have, my husband died. I called my pastor. <clears throat> One of my daughters worked part-time with Evergreen Funeral Home. In the midst of crying and screaming, I asked for my husband. I said, y'all, is he coming home? And somebody said, Stacy's gone to get him. I thought she was gone. Bring him home. No, but I made it through that one. It still hurts. Yeah. I buried him on the 23rd of January, 25th of January. Things just kept going on. At 4.18 in the morning, I woke up, I couldn't breathe. I felt like somebody was choking me. I couldn't holler for my daughter, but I could dial. I said, I can't breathe. This is in 2021, so y'all know where I'm going. I got infected with COVID, and I didn't find out till later that it was at his funeral. And uh, when I got to the hospital, everything was a, just a daze. I had no control of nothing of me. Everything was like, I, I wanted my children. Nobody could come in the hospital. I wanted my pastor to pray with me, come in the hospital, just touch me, tell me, Dodie, it's not real. I wanted somebody to say it wasn't real. Why I was all of it so. Actually, I didn't care if I died or not. I didn't care because I had just buried the love of my life and didn't know why God took him, why? I uh, experienced something in that hospital. I left, told the aide to turn my lights off, close my curtains, turn my TV off. And she kept saying, what do you, what do you, I said, just leave me alone. I left out of that room, I wanted to pray. My prayer was gonna be, God, take me. Take me, just take me. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to live on machines. I don't want to do this. God got me through the machines. They wanted to put me on the ventilator. My children prayed in that parking lot. God changed things around. Stats went up. And they said, we don't have to put it on the ventilator, but we want to put it in ICU, I think, is what it was. Everybody, he, the doctor was talking more with Keisha. I uh, closed the curtains. And I asked God to just take me. My mom came to me as plain as day. So I'm looking at you guys sitting right here now. And my mama said, Dodie, her voice was just as crisp and pretty. I've always taught y'all how to pray for yourself. You don't have to wait on nobody to pray for you. And I said, Mama, she said, you lift your hands up. I couldn't lift nothing up. COVID had my body just almost paralyzed. My mama, when my mama stopped talking to me, I took that button to that bed and laid myself all the way back walking. I took one arm, one hand to push the other one up. Y'all, I started praying. I prayed and prayed. I asked God to forgive me. Forgive me for the things I wanted to do, where I wanted to do. 
wanted to go. I didn't want to be without my husband. I didn't tell my kids a lot of things. But I started praying. I heard the nurse come in, and she said, the doctor wants us to give you some Ativan. I know all about Ativan. And she said, no. I kept on praying. The aid lady, she was an older lady, she came in. She said, leave her alone. I know what she's doing. I know where she's coming from. She's going to be all right. I prayed so and cried so until when I came up out of that, because I wouldn't eat, but I didn't know if the eat was, couldn't eat was COVID or great, uh, grieving. The grief was deep. Because any time I ever went to the hospital, to the doctor, my husband was right there. I got out. I mean, I prayed, everything went good. I mean, I prayed, the aid lady came in, she turned the TV on, and the first thing came on was Lee Williams singing Cooling Water, and that was my favorite song. <laughs> and I was like, how did that get on that TV? But I thank God that I had a village. Amen. I had a village. One young lady sitting in this church right now We've been friends over 20 years, 20 some years. Sister Tina Dollarton. Every day, every day planning my mama's funeral, she was there. Every day planning my husband's <coughs> funeral, she was there. You got to have that person. You got to have, we rode around Dodie Mae, she always called me Dodie Mae. Dodie Mae, you want to talk. Dodie Mae, you want to do this. Just whatever I wanted, she was there. I thank God for her. I thank God for my pastor. Pastor called at hospital one day, wanted to talk to me, and I, he called, he said, she's screaming and going on and everything. I was, that was the day of losing it in that hospital. But y'all, God bought me out of COVID. Hallelujah. I wanted to come to church. I told my daughter, Keisha, she said, Mama, you think it's too soon? I said, I want to put on my uniform. She said, Mama, you need to put on something. You know, I said, I want my uniform on. I said, so they'll know I'm there supporting them. I walked in this church, and Lord, I tell you, mm. I walked in this church, and I felt like God's hands was around me. I felt like God hugged me. I sit back there, and I said, all I could say was, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. But I'm going to tell you, grief is deep. Yes. Grief will kill you if you let it. Amen. I stayed on, I ain't going to say I stayed on my knees for y'all. I got some bad knees. But <laughs> they've been changed out maybe once at once. But I stayed in my prayer posture. Amen. And I prayed and I prayed because once suicide hits you, right. if you don't pray your way out of it, you will kill yourself. Amen. I wasn't ready to get up out of here. I lost my mom and my husband. But I said, God, I'm not ready. And God wasn't ready for me to go. Because if he was ready for me, COVID would have took me right on up out of here. Amen. But I thank God that I'm here. I thank God for my village in this church. My church was my support system, along with my family. My church was my support system. Amen. And it wasn't, Sister Doty, if you need me, no, 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 just call me. I, would, I didn't get them kind of calls. What do you need me to do? It wasn't no if. I don't like that if you need me. You already know what I'm going through. Amen. And after funerals, that's when you need your village. Because right. after the funeral, you don't see. People ain't bringing food no more. People ain't doing nothing no more. They going on about their life. But I got a village in my church. Amen. I got a village that lady sitting right there, my daughter, Lakeisha, she was running everything in that hospital. 
but I saw my child. I had to grieve again when I saw my child when I got home from the hospital. I was in a wheelchair. I actually couldn't walk well. I said, where's my baby? She broke down. Cause she never get she never got to feel anything because she had to be the strong one of the family. She broke. I said, Y'all just take the roll me around to my baby. They said, Mama, we gotta get you in the bed. But I've been through a lot. I've gone through it. And I'm still here. Amen. Amen. Now that's my testimony. I'm still here. Amen. You're still here. And you don't look like what you've been through. And I, I want to say, I, I know we, we do have a, a time on tonight, and as the moderator, it is my responsibility to keep us on time. But Dota, I feel like you needed that. I feel like you needed that. I think there's been um, just a constant wave of things that have happened, and sometimes you just need to stop, and you just need to feel. And I feel like, I feel like you needed that. So thank you, Dodie, for sharing, for sharing your story, sharing your testimony with us. Pastor, did you want to speak to that? Um, absolutely. She just talked about, in a short span of time, losing her mother, losing her husband, losing her health, losing her independence to be able to move around without assistance, and losing a number of other things. And you know what it brings to my mind? Uh, in Habakkuk 1 and 2, it says, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry? and you won't hear me. How, he's, he then says, I even cry out unto you of violence, things that are happening to me that are unjust, and you won't save me. And this is my question to all of you. Have any of you ever said, why is God letting bad things happen to a good person? Yeah. Anybody ever had, I've had that moment, hey, raise your hand if you have. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a perfect person. She's not, none of us are perfect persons, but we all have that moment where we say like, real talk, God, how, how much more are you gonna put on me? And you know, people make the statement, he'll never put on you more than what you can bear, but that's not Bible. The Bible never said that, I talked about this in prayer, it never said that he wouldn't put more on you than what you could bear. It said that when, when you are going through something, he will provide a way of escape from the temptation. But it is in your weakness that his strength is made perfect. And, and I'm getting down to this. God never promised any of us that we wouldn't go through anything. I'm going to give you real quick practical, real quick spiritual. I'm going to toss it back to you. From a practical perspective, why do bad things happen to good people? It's not God's fault. It's Adam's fault. It's sin. And this isn't like holiness. Like I'm not talking about y'all have done wrong and you're going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. Sin, when it entered the earth, shifted everything. Our DNA was different before sin. Adam and Eve, all they were eating from was the tree of, of life. And when they decided to eat from another tree, God put them out of the garden and they no longer had access to what was giving them continuous life. And so our physical anatomy began changing. And man developed a lifespan before man was living forever from the tree of life. But now when his DNA changes, now man has a period when he will die. Man, man, and, and you never know when man is gonna die. You never know when you're gonna lose a husband, a mother, a child. You don't know which child is going to make it. You may have had two children and then the third one is a miscarriage. You, 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 you never know because God never promises that life will be easy. But what he does promise is that he will be with us. Yes. And, and this is very important. I grew up uh, in Hampton, Virginia, where uh, we had, uh, you, you know, sometimes you see bridges over water. And, uh, and back in Virginia, where my wife and I live, there were tunnels through water. Here's the thing, the bridge and the tunnel does not remove the water. Right. It's just a way either over or through the water. Yeah. And that is what our relationship with God and our support system with people 
And sometimes sitting and healthily processing what we're going through does for us. It doesn't remove the trouble, but it will help you to get over it or to get through it until you have to deal with it again. I got a big scar on my leg right now that you cannot see, and it's, it's, it's healed, but it's still tender to the touch. Some things are still going to be tender. Sometimes you need to talk it out like she just did. Sometimes you need to pray it out. Sometimes you need to worship through it, you know? But life happens. It's not fun. But those are the moments that you get a chance to see God in a different way. The goodness of God cannot be appreciated if everything is always good in life. His goodness isn't appreciated until things go south. Amen. And Sister Helen Ratliff, you have served in, served as a hospice nurse for a number of years. And uh, one of the things that, that Mama Doty started out with, she was taking care of her mother and she was doing it all on her own. How many people have ever had to take care of someone that was in hospice? That is a huge undertaking. And there's a lot of resources and support that's out there that's available to us that we don't know about. Sister Helen Radliff, will you share with us what some of those resources are? Okay, so hospice and palliative care is one of the resources that's available um, to anyone uh, who qualifies. Mostly it's people, when they think of hospice and palliative care, they think of cancer. However, um, it has evolved so much more than just cancer. It's with dementia and Alzheimer's and any other COPD, chronically ill, terminally ill um, disease process. Now for the African American community, uh, there is a disparity. Why? I'm still kind of, I've just started researching that. I think it's a fear of the unknown. Uh, they think, oh, I put them on hospice, they're going to die. Hospice is actually a support for when you are caring for your loved one at home because most of um, our community, our culture, we want to keep our family members at home. And they are a resource that will allow that. They are extra help that comes in and uh, man help you manage pain, help you take care of the activities of daily living, like bathing, getting them cleaned up, shaved, uh, getting them out of bed, in bed. Um, they're, they're extra help to keep them at home. Um, when things start declining, uh, we have resources available to help explain to you in layman's term, everyday term, what you're seeing is normal. And when you get put on hospice, mostly Medicare, but commercial insurance cover hospice as well, um, they usually say your prognosis is six months or less. That is what I think um, kind of scares uh, our community. However, once symptoms are managed, they tend to live longer than six months. Uh, we've had patients that we've had to actually discharge from hospice because they've actually gotten better. Not cured, but they their symptoms are controlled so they have a better quality of life than what they would without it. So um, even after the loved one passes, we have um, resources that follow up with the families for up to a year to make sure that um, they don't need anything and they have a, the patients and family have a care team. They have a doctor, a nurse, an aide, a chaplain, or a so, and a social worker. Um, if you so desire, some people like they have their own spiritual counselor, they might decline the chaplain. Um, so that's allowed as well. So we just have to um, really um, get the information to the people to really let them know what hospice is. It's not about dying, it's about living your fullest life until whenever the Lord calls you home. Amen. And Sister, Sister Ratliff has provided um, some resources that we're gonna email out to everyone after the session on hospice. We're gonna be sending out some other resources about 
you know, how to support your children that are grieving, how to support yourself as you're grieving. And so we wanna make sure that we get that all, get that information to you guys. And so we have one more person that's gonna share with us tonight um, that I think, um, I, I know personally I've experienced. Um, there's one thing for the preparation of hospice, but it's just something about a car accident. Just that tragic, sudden losing someone that just never really, that sting never really goes away. So this is Tamika, will you share with us tonight? Thank you, this is the first time that I've shared um, publicly about the incident when my father passed away. Um, he had a car accident in 2015 and it was a really horrific accident to completely shut the interstate down. And that morning of, I recall I was at home recovering from surgery. And I had just seen my father a couple of days prior coming over, checking on me like he, he normally would. And my mother got a phone call telling her to get to the hospital to bring somebody with her. We we're going driving thinking this, he has a, he's in surgery. But coming from the, working in ER for many years, I understand that when we got there, when the chaplain was there, I immediately knew what was happening. And I had my son with me at the time and my mother and they came in and gave us all the information. And I was, I was in shock, because I was like, no. I just talked to him really a few hours prior. And I said, I demanded, I need to see him now. Because I need, and I just see records. I need to know what that y'all did, everything y'all could do to save him. If they didn't want me to read medical records, I said, I understand what I'm reading, so let me read them. And I read them, and I still was questioning everything, and that's just kind of how my mind works. I need to understand it for it to, for to, to make some rationale behind it. And I recall having to call, I'm the youngest, and so I had to call all my siblings. And I, had to, and I remember t having to tell the same story repeatedly. And that it became harder to say. And I'm here at the hospital with my mom and myself. And I ended up calling up with, you know, my son's godparents. I called them and they, they rushed there immediately. And they kind of helped me navigate through this. And because I'm in shock. And my mom is in shock. And then at that point, I remember my mother been in her church now almost 60 years. It seemed like the entire church was there. And in the lobby, but my mother wouldn't leave until everybody else left. And I had to tell, call them on the phone, tell them, y'all stop coming. I need to get her home. And that day, I became a caretaker because my parents had been married 52 years at that time. She didn't ever leave with anyone outside of her parents' home. So she immediately moved in with me. And I had to deal with that, and I had to deal with my son at the time was seven. You asked about Zachary, and I tried, we talked about today. He wouldn't come because he said, Mommy, I don't want to, why are you talking about something that hurt you so bad? And that same year, he had just got diagnosed with autism spectrum. And you talk about reliving it, I've relived my dad's death so many times because it's just in the last couple of years, he's starting out to understand because on the spectrum, you, you process very differently. And so no matter how I explain to him the accident, he, he doesn't understand. And I keep explaining it. And he said, I may cry tonight. I said, I may cry too. We can cry together. But he's like, he, and he's a male. And you know, he's very private with his feelings and so am I. So for me to be here and to explain it, I just, somebody needs to understand and be able to work through what I had to work through because then I became angry because my siblings left me to deal with my mom by myself and I had a child. I didn't allow him to go to the funeral because I didn't think he would understand and now he's asking, why didn't you let me go? And he's upset that he didn't get to go say bye. And at that time, all I knew was I needed to protect him from grief, protect him from what he didn't understand. And now I have to often relive it because anytime somebody dies, he takes it personal and he say, I know they were my papa. And he, and he gets very sensitive about it, and I don't sometimes know what to do with those feelings. And I became angry with my family because they let me have to do it. I had to plan the funeral because they, they, act as if they couldn't do anything. And now because they let me do it, because I guess they said I was controlling. And so I had I planned everything. I had to take care of my mom, but I needed, and everybody kept telling me, be strong for your mom, be strong for Zach. But I kept thinking, who's going to be strong for me? I couldn't cry. It wasn't until a year later that I had to see I needed, I feel like I need to be moving past it, but I wasn't, and I was in this dark place. 
so I got I had to get a counselor and sitting down with her I think I cried she said I think I cried for a, a month it's like I'm a bigger now but I couldn't let nobody see me cry because see my dad was very he was a hero to me but I didn't grow up in a home where you were told you love you all the time I, they showed me but they didn't verbalize it but my dad did and, it, and so that was like the first man they told me I love you and he, he loved me and it was unconditional he didn't want anything he just wanted me to be happy my, dig, my dad knew my resume more than I knew my resume because that's how proud he was of me and to have to raise a, child, raise a boy that has these difficulties my dad understood them and they understood each other I didn't know what to do so I, get, I, I was angry and then during that grieving period that's when I found grace and coming here to grace is the beginning to help me and I would sometimes talk to Pastor Green. I didn't fully talk to Pastor Green, but I would talk to him. You know, Pastor Green, you can pull it out of you when you try not to. <laughs> and he could help me working through those emotions that I just could not seem to deal with. And I would come to church so many times, and I'm in church, and I'm sad because I learned to math. And I, I, de I developed a, God gave me what I call divine sisters, to these women that will surround themselves around me. And they help me even now when I'm. They know when I'm on the island because I will go to an island when I don't want to feel. And that was my problem is I don't want to feel emotion. I want to be quiet. And I, sometimes I sit in church and I'm quiet and I talk to the church. My soul was broken and I had tears. wanted somebody sometimes to put their hand on my shoulder and say it's okay somebody said we got you and God gave me these sisters who would do that they lift me up in prayer and they'll call me sometimes at 5 o'clock in the morning and say it's okay for this time because they feel me in the spirit because they know I'm probably wide awake because I will sleep 2-3 hour days they would do it but, but I learned to function like that I learned to I would I put myself I don't know why I went back to school to get another degree I didn't need another degree but I went to get another degree just so I didn't have to feel. Yeah. I didn't want to feel. And I began to work in ministry. And it started when I was working in ministry, I realized I can't give to people what I need to give to them because I'm bleeding on them. And I didn't have the strength to tell them that. And that's why I, I was like, I can't, I can't seem to, I can't function, God. I need, and that's why I said, I need some help. Why am I not? What was past? I lost the job that I had for 25 years that I gave everything to it. And while I need that income to take care of my family, I lost my job. And I'm like, God, what am I going to do? My mother is here. I have my son. But God kept me. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank Amen. you, God. That's why I just say, God gave, showed me grace. I'm still, am, I through, am I over it? I wish I was, but I'm still on my healing journey. Yeah. And that's why sometimes I come in and I'm, I'm quiet. And I do get, since Green gets on me all the time, get off your, get off your island. <laughs> you don't have to be by yourself. And I, sometimes I try to be by myself, and I'm, I'm stubborn. <laughs> but God has blessed me with people who can see it, and they will really reach out and pull me out of it. Amen. And that's why it's important to get you a village. She's looking at my phone. Get you a village. <laughs> get, you, get you a village, because your village will help you and give you that support. Amen. 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 Can we put our hands together for everyone on this panelist tonight? We had so, so, so much more information that we wanted to share with you guys, but that the hour is definitely far spent. But I did want, there was one last thing that I felt like was good for, for us to, to be able to share, um, because I feel like this is something that all of us can do. And Sister Radliff, I don't know if, if, if you can speak to this Elder Holland or Pastor Green, if, if either one of our subject matter experts wanna kind of chime in here for this last thought. Grief etiquette. Have you ever had somebody walk up? Girl, I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. Girl, if you need anything, you see, I'm, I need everything. If you need anything, just let me know. But there is a proper way to support people while they're grieving. Sister Helen, could you just give us a few things? What are, what are some things, give us a script. What are some things that we can say 
that would be comforting and supporting, but, but not insensitive. Actually, you can say nothing. That's the best thing, because what they need is a listening ear, because everybody grieves in a different way. Even though you lost your mother and you lost your mother, y'all had two totally different relationships yes. with your mother. So you, I understand, I've been through that. No, you haven't. I, I know how you feel. No, you do not because that was my daddy or that was my mom. So just listen, really, just listen. And no one can tell you how to grieve. Grieving is cyclic. You know, there's five, anger, denial, acceptance, bargaining, and depression. These emotions are real. They are real and you have every right to them, but don't stay there. But don't stay there. Okay. So um, just listen and listen some more. And don't, if you need anything, let me know. Grinds my gears. Amen. Just do it. Right. Like Nike said, just do it. Yes. Just do it. Pastor. Um, faith and feelings don't always walk together. Right. Um, you, you cannot, I wish we could, but you cannot always help how you will feel. We're, we're not wired or, or built with the luxury of being able to schedule our feelings. I don't get to determine when I'll fall apart no matter how much I try. I was driving down the highway the, the, highway the other day and saw something that reminded me of my uncle and I lost it. Yesterday, I was out with some pastor friends of mine just for a getaway, um, and I was talking with them uh, about some family things that happened in my family some years ago that I thought I was over. I realized I wasn't over it. And I started tearing up while I was talking to them. You don't always get to choose when your feelings will show up. And sometimes we make people who perhaps are in a dark place, feel like, you know, you've let the devil win. How many of you have ever been in a dark place? Sometimes you don't always get to choose when your feelings shut off the lights. But, can I go back to the Bible? Uh, it just came to my mind, and that same, let me see here, Habakkuk 3. Now, I just read to you in Habakkuk 1 when he said, how long is this going to last? How long am I going to go through this? And you're not responding. You're not doing anything. You're not changing anything. It's like you're just listening. Right? But watch this. Because we're waiting for God sometimes to shift things when really the power is in your hand. In Habakkuk 3, where is it? Habakkuk 3 and 17 he says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, that's loss. Neither shall fruit be in the vines, that's loss. The labor of the olive shall fail. Somebody say, that's loss. And the field shall yield no meat. Somebody say, that's loss. He said, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. Somebody say, that's loss. What does the man of God say next? He said, yet I will rejoice. Now, when you find, can I, I got to stand up. When you find yourself in the dark, you got a choice that you, that you have to make. Either I'm just going to sit in the dark and let my feelings continue to control me, or I'm going to take control. See, when the rope breaks, it ain't over. You just drop your rope some more so that you can reestablish things and use what you got to try to make it through. When you find yourself in the dark, open up a door for yourself to have an outlet and try to find ways to replace the darkness. You said, you, you said that you went and got a degree and you were saying you didn't know if that was the best thing to do. No, that was a good thing to do. Sometimes you have to throw yourself into something that's gonna create another emotion. 
And this may be tender still for a while every time I revisit it, but I got something else to create another emotion. Or if I'm not going to open the door so that I can have an outlet to something else, somebody say this with me, let the light in. This goes back to your worship, your prayer life. Asking God, look, I can't seem to get out of this, so let me invite you in. That's why the man of God said, I will rejoice. I'm going to, since I cannot change what's going on around me, I'm going to take control of what's going on inside of me. And I'm going to do something that will invite God into the circumstances because when I can't change them, I bring the one in who can. That's how you deal with the dark. Amen. I don't think there's nothing else to be said after that. So everybody, I hope you guys enjoyed this therapy session. Everybody breathe in. Breathe out and release. Breathe in again. Breathe out. Um, I ask that everyone, if you go into the Grace app, there is a survey. So if you go to the Grace app right now, it'll only take a few moments. Go to that app, and Jen wants to get your feedback. We want to know, did this help you? Did you guys find this relevant? What type of programming do you want to see from this group in the future? And so we ask that you fill out that survey. It just takes a few moments for the team. Again, we thank God for Elder Chris Brassard and Elder and, uh, Missionary Angela Harris for leading this group. Put your hands together again for the panelists on tonight. And you are back in the hands of our pastor. Come on, let's put our hands together for this panel. Let's celebrate this panel tonight. Come on, stand on your feet and celebrate this panel for sharing their stories and sharing their expertise and sharing their insight. Let's give it up for them. It takes a lot of courage to be able to come up here and open your wounds, revisit your pains for the benefit. You may have your seats of other people. How many of you were blessed by this? Yeah. I'm grateful to God again for the Grace Empowerment Network uh, that's being led by Elder uh, Chris Broussard and uh, Missionary Angela Harris. Can we clap our hands for them one more time? They did a wonderful job uh, coordinating this and uh, I'm excited because this isn't it. Uh, once a quarter, we're going to uh, have conversations like these, these critical, necessary conversations. Sometimes we need to stop dancing and shouting and we need to take a moment to reason among ourselves so that we can expand ourselves cognitively to understand what's going on and how do I get through this? You know, what are the practical steps? And uh, I'm excited about... Uh, the next one of these that is uh, coming up. I want you to mark your calendar for June 12th. Everybody say June 12th. June 12th. June 12th. We're going to have another one uh, of these on a Wednesday evening. And we're going to deal with mental health. Mental health. Um, I've always said this. It's like the devil is an after stuff. Necessary. He's not after your money because he can't spend it. He's not after your car because he can't drive it. He's not after your house because he can't live in it. But what he is after is your mind. The Bible said that it is with the mind that we serve the Lord. So how else can I stop you from being effective in the things of God? Not by taking you out of the church, but by taking God out of your mind. The, 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 this, and this is a very, very necessary conversation about mental health and so I'm excited uh, we're going to have some guests with us uh, that night uh, Paula San who is uh, a licensed clinical uh, pastoral counselor uh, and a few others that are going to be sharing in that conversation and I want you all to plan to be here for that one or if there's anyone that you believe will benefit from that dialogue on June 12th uh, invite them to be with us for that conversation amen Amen. Uh, we're getting ready to prepare our hearts to honor God with our giving on tonight. So I want to do this real quickly. I want everybody uh, that has been blessed this evening, uh, I just want you to prepare uh, a seed to give. You can get a $20 seed in your hand. Stand with that. 
uh, real quickly all over the sanctuary. Those of you that will do that, thank you. I want you to grab that and stand. Um, yeah, I want you to grab that and stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you don't have the 20, I want you to get the best thing you do have and stand. In a moment, I'm going to pray for the offering, the benediction, and grief all in one. Can I do that? Is that all right? Amen. This was such a good conversation. This was such a good conversation. I was getting text messages while we were in the thick of this dialogue. People just sharing how blessed they were by this conversation. This is so good. Amen. Those of you that are sorry, if you don't have a dime to sell, I want you to stand as well. We want to pray for you. Amen. And if you don't mind, just reach over and touch somebody. Just touch someone. People wonder why we touch so much because we spend so much of our lives out of touch. Sometimes you need to touch something that's touching the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight. Thank you for the person to my left, the person to my right. I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you even now would minister to them. I don't know what grief looks like for them, what kind of grief that they're dealing with. But one thing I do know, I know the Lord. And I know that there is no issue, no problem, no malady that any of us can face that you are not equipped to address your God. You made us. You knew what we would go through before we went through it. And obviously, if you didn't stop it, there was something, something that you planned to bring out of it. Even if it is just a better version of us, a stronger version of us, a more wise version of us, whatever it is. God, I pray that you get the glory out of this. Somebody say, say, Lord, get the glory out of this. There's somebody here that lost a husband. They lost a wife. They lost a child. But God, at the end of the day, get the glory out of this. There's somebody that lost. They lost a career. They lost an opportunity. They lost a door. But somebody said, Lord, get the glory out of this. There's somebody who is grieving the loss of good health. They're grieving the loss of financial stability. But whatever kind of grief they're dealing with, I ask tonight that you would get the glory out of it and strengthen my brother, strengthen my sister, build them up where they're torn down, encourage their hearts. And Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus against every devil that seeks to make life hard, that seeks to take control of our emotions and make life difficult for us. The devil is a liar. I speak that you will have peace even when you're by yourself. I speak that you will have peace in your home, peace in your car, peace. Wherever you go, we speak peace in the name of Jesus. I ask now, Father, that you will bless the seed, bless the givers. And even as we prepare to leave this place, but never your presence. Father, would you watch over us, protect us, stay back the hand of the mugger, raper, and robber, and all that would offend until we meet again this coming Sunday. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father. And all the people of the Lord said, praise God. Amen. Would you come and bring that seed from wherever you are? As you're preparing to exit, amen, I want to remind you Sunday morning we'll be right here for worship. I want you to bring somebody, bring a friend, encourage somebody, amen, to come to church. We love you and we'll see you. Anchor Nights is going to be Sunday evening at 5 p.m. That's our young adult ministry. So please plan to join them for that service as well. Men's Book Chat, Saturday at 3 p.m men's book chat men's book chat saturday at 3 p.m have a good night